It's time to declare my 2022 Buffalo Bills superlatives today on Locked On Bills. You are Locked On Bills, your daily Buffalo Bills podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Bills Mafia? It's Joe Marino from the Draft Network, and I'm your host of Locked On Bills. Happy Thursday to you, and thank you for making Locked On Bills your first listen. Every day, or if you're joining us on the YouTube channel, your first watch every day. Today on the podcast, I am going to deliver my 2022 Buffalo Bills season superlatives. And I've done this for a couple of years now, and it's something that I enjoy doing. And basically what's going to happen is I have seven different superlatives, and I'm going to give you my answer for the Bills as I foresee things in the 2022 season. The superlatives are breakout guy, comeback kid, rising star, don't forget about, needs to rebound, dark horse MVP, and under the radar. This is going to be fun. And this is one of those episodes and topics where I would love your feedback. I would love to see how you would answer each one of these items. So hit me up on Twitter at the Joe Marino. Join the Lockdown Bills Twitter community. And let's keep this discussion going. But here are my answers. Let's start with breakout guy. And my choice is Gabriel Davis. I think that he is primed for a breakout season. I think he's the easy choice here. I think Dawson Knox had his breakout season last year. I have a spot for Ed Oliver coming up. Tremaine Edmonds could be an option here. But the guy I like is Gabriel Davis. And what's interesting about Gabriel Davis is that his rookie season in 2020 and his sophomore season in 2021 were pretty similar statistically. Literally, like the same amount of catches and very similar in terms of yards. But within that, you can find growth. Three main areas of growth that I can back up with a number that I want to share with you regarding Gabriel Davis are first, his reception percentage. And we're comparing 2020 to 2021, and then that's going to get us excited for 2022. The first number I want to give you is his reception percentage. It increased. From 54.9 to 60.8. That's over a 5% increase, or right at about a 5% increase in reception percentage. He was more efficient with the opportunities that he had to make a catch. Now, there's a story behind every statistic. Baked into that number is developing chemistry or more chemistry with Josh Allen creating better opportunities to catch the football because he's a better route runner and understands how to get to space more effectively. It's finishing targets with more consistency. And so while he may have had the exact same number of catches year over year, the percentage of targets to catches increased, and there's good reasons why. The next number, his drop percentage. His drop percentage was 11.4 in 2020. It went down to 8.2. That's a good increase, right? That's a an improvement of like a little over 3%. That's very good. And it has room to get even better. He can knock another, another 3% off of that. But the reality is he was more consistent at the catch point, catching the football, finishing plays. There were some situations in 2020, especially late in the season, where Gabriel Davis didn't finish some of the plays he should have. That got better in 2021. He became more consistent. And this next one's a big one. Contested catch percentage. 
Gabriel Davis only hauled in 25% of his contested catches as a rookie. That went up astronomically to 76.9% in 2021. One of the most appealing things about Gabriel Davis is his blend of size and ball skills. He presents that to this offense in ways that no other receiver does. And winning with a much higher clip of consistency at the catch point when it's contested is a big deal for Gabriel Davis. Things are slowing down for him. Things slowed down for him big time in 2021. Now, I don't know if a contested catch rate of 76.9% is sustainable. That's a, that's incredibly high. But it's a whole lot better than the 25%, which was very dif- disappointing as a rookie. So I, I was really pleased to see growth in that area. And now, obviously, with Cole Beasley and Emmanuel Sanders no longer in the mix, that frees up a ton of targets. Like, over 150 targets are now available for the remaining weapons in this offense. And I think we can all agree that Gabriel Davis is going to eat up a lot of those. I'm sure he'll be targeted over 100 times this year. And so the opportunity is going to be there, but also just the growth. And obviously, this guy's coming off a historic performance in the playoffs. The most receiving touchdowns ever in a playoff game in NFL history with four against the Chiefs. And so I've spent a lot of time wondering when it comes to Gabriel Davis is how much of a beneficiary has he been to his role in the offense as you know, basically wide receiver three slash four. When you think about the pecking order for targets, kind of the fourth or fifth option. So how is he going to fare with a higher percentage of the market share? How is he going to fare as the guy who receives the second most amount of targets in this Buffalo Bills high-octane passing offense? Well, when I think about the opportunity, when I think about the growth that I saw year over year, I get very excited about that. That's why he's my choice for breakout guy. The next one is the comeback kid. And maybe your answer here is going to surprise you. Maybe you're thinking about Tredavious White. Well, you know, Tredavious White was on the team for like 11 games last year. You might miss some time this year, but I didn't really feel comfortable in his first season back from an ACL injury putting this on him. The guy that I went with is another wide receiver, and that's Jamison Crowder. There's a lot of intrigue for me when it comes to Jamison Crowder becoming part of this offense kind of think he's underrated right now among the fan base. I just don't think there's enough enough hype for Jamison Crowder. And he's not coming off of his best season with the Jets. Obviously a difficult situation there with a new coaching staff, a really inexperienced coaching staff, a rookie quarterback that wasn't supported well in terms of infrastructure. And Zach Wilson, obviously, he had a big jump coming from BYU. And Crowder had a career low 8.8 yards per catch. Second fewest catches in a season for his career at 51. Second fewest amount of yards for his career in a season at 447. But he's been a much better player, a much more productive player previously. Jamison Crowder is 29 years old coming over to be a member of the Buffalo Bills. And there are a lot of parallels to where he's at in his career to where Cole Beasley was in his career when he came over to the Buffalo Bills. So Jamison Crowder, 29 years old, has played in 96 career games, has 409 catches, 4,607 yards, and 28 touchdowns. If you compare that to Cole Beasley, who came to the Bills at 30 years old. In 103 games, he had 319 catches, 3,271 yards, and 23 touchdowns. So again, to to kind of give you this side-by-side as best as I can in an audio platform, Jamison Crowder, 29, Cole Beasley, 30, when they came to the Bills. Crowder, 96 games, Beasley, 103 games. 
Crowder, 409 catches. Beasley, 319. Crowder, 4,607 career yards. Beasley, 3,271. Crowder, 28 touchdowns. Beasley, 23. So the Bills are getting a younger and more productive player in Crowder compared to Beasley when they came to Buffalo. And oh, by the way, Jameson Crowder gets a much more established, better version of Josh Allen. in a role in this offense that has been very important when it comes to the slot receiver role. And just like Cole Beasley, Jamison Crowder has great hands. He's got great ball skills. He's a great separator. He's got good athleticism. And so when you compare the contracts, like, it's not close. I can't believe that the Bills were able to sign Jamison Crowder for, like, a very modest one-year deal compared to what Cole Beasley commanded that offseason. And so I'm very excited about Jamison Crowder, and I, I think it's fair to put him in here as the comeback kid and be excited about what he can be for this passing game. I don't think we're talking enough about this. The Bills got a really good player in Crowder, a much more established player than Beasley was when he came over, and he was younger. So let me buy up all the uh, the Jamison Crowder hype that I can. This episode is brought to you by Rock Auto. With the ever-increasing numbers of makes and models, it's now impossible for your local chain auto parts store to stock all the parts you need. Wind or often pointless or seemingly intimidating questions like, is your Odyssey an LX or an EX? And wait while the person behind the counter orders the parts on their computer, choosing the only brand their warehouse happens to carry. You have computers with access to rockauto.com at home and in your pocket. Save time and save money when using Rock Auto. Why would you choose to spend 30%, 50%, even 100% more for the same parts from a chain store or a car dealership? They have everything you can need. Brake parts, tail lamps, motor oil, and even new carpet. Go to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts available for your car or truck. Make sure you write Locked On in their How Did You Hear About Us box so they know that we sent you. They have amazing selection, reliably low prices, and all the parts your car will ever need over at rockauto.com. All right, let's get into some more of these superlatives. The next one is the rising star. And as I teased already in this podcast, I had a spot for Ed Oliver, and here it is. He's my pick for rising star. He's coming off of a good season. Coming off of somewhat of a breakout campaign. Had 10 tackles for loss in 2021. He had 11 combined in 2019 and 2020. He had a career-high 48 pressures on the quarterback in 2021. And so, obviously, he took a major step last year, and I think he'll take another step this year. I'm very excited about what's around him. I think Ed Oliver has the best players around him on the defensive line that he's had in his career. I don't need to go through the Rolodex, but hello, Von Miller's here. Tim Settle, Daquan Jones, Jordan Phillips. That's going to help Ed Oliver make even more plays and be more dynamic. So I'm excited about what he did last year and the growth of last year. I'm more excited than ever about what's around him. And oh, by the way, this is his fourth season. Next year, he's playing under the fifth-year option. When I say next year, I mean 2023. But what he does this year is going to really dictate the temperature of the extension conversations, the contract extension conversations that are going to heat up after the season. So I think you're going to get a really dialed in, focused, best version of Ed Oliver to maximize this opportunity with these players around him, building off of last year and being mindful of this is his big chance to get a payday. And that defensive tackle class of 2019 was really good. Quinn and Williams, Christian Wilkins, Dexter Lawrence, Jeffrey Simmons, Ed Oliver. All of those guys have played at a level that has positioned themselves well to earn a, an extension with their teams. And it's going to be really fun. It's going to be kind of like the 2017 cornerback class. You guys remember this? Marlon Humphrey, Marshawn Lattimore. 
Tredavious White. You know, all these guys, they're all playing well. They're good players for their teams. And it's all about who's going to sign that extension and who's going to get the most money. And then it, there was just like kind of a big domino effect. Trey White's first. Then you see, you know, you kind of see everybody fall into line. You're going to see something similar here with these defensive tackles. And I think you're going to get a great version of Ed Oliver this season. Very excited for him. The next one is don't forget about. I feel like I've tried to sneak this in and weave this into a lot of our conversations this offseason. And so I want to do it again. But I don't think we should forget about scheme evolution. Scheme evolution is going to happen this year. There's been so many clues based on some of the coaching turnover and the players brought in and the types of players brought in that suggest that the Bills might play a little different style of football this year, and I think that's a good thing. Offensively, we're probably looking at more two tight end sets, more 12 personnel. You've got Dawson Knox and O.J. Howard. You have a coaching staff that has a lot of history using multiple tight ends. That's going to be a fun wrinkle. And so maybe your plan to play the Bills over the last couple of seasons based on the way that they ran their offense with an 11 personnel heavy group, 10 personnel heavy. And I think those groupings will still be very prevalent in this offense. And maybe you've, as an opponent of the Bills, you've thought a lot about your, your sub packages and you know playing more nickel defense, using your slot defender. All right, cool. Well, now that slot corner receivers coming off and it's OJ Howard, you got to play differently. This is going to allow Josh Allen, I think, to work the middle of the field a little bit more. So I'm excited about that. You have a pass catching back now in James Cook, a speed presence that can, you know, really stress defenses horizontally with how he can run the football, but also present a pass catching back that the Bills really haven't had. And then you have these new offensive influences in Aaron Cromer, Mike Shula, and Joe Brady. So I think you're going to see a lot of scheme evolution on offense for those reasons. And obviously, Ken Dorsey, your new offensive coordinator, is going to put his stamp on this unit. Defensively, the Bills were very intentional about the linebacker position, right? They they cut A.J. Klein, but they drafted two linebackers, including a third-round pick in Terrell Bernard, Balin Spector later on. They signed Markel Lee. You can tell there's been a deliberate intent here to kind of do something here at linebacker. And I think that stems from them wanting to be a little bit more traditional at times to play three linebackers, but also maintain their nickel principles. And that's going to be really interesting to see because I think teams are going to want to run the football against the Bills. I've been through this a million times. The entire AFC East is a run-heavy division. The entire AFC North is a run-heavy division. The Colts and Titans, the two best teams in the AFC South, are run-heavy teams. And while you might not think of the West so much as a run-heavy group, it's going to be an important part of what they do. And you know that's probably your best collection of teams in the NFL, and you want to invite them to come to your place in December, in January. Playoff football. Josh Allen's your quarterback. Teams are going to want to run the football against you to keep 17 on the sideline. Well, you've got to be able to match up against that. And I think the Bills going with an emphasis here on that third linebacker is going to allow them to maintain their nickel principles but have a guy that can play a little bit more effectively in the box and play downhill. You have more athleticism at cornerback with Kyer Elam now. You have more complementary skill sets on this defensive line. Think about this defensive tackle group with Settle and Jones and, of course, Ed Oliver to go with um, Jordan Phillips, guys that are interchangeable a bit. These defensive ends, you have a couple of guys that you feel good about reducing inside and boogie bash them and, I mean, maybe even Groot a little bit. A guy in Von Miller that's a speedy, bendy player. You just have so much more at your disposal defensively from a skill set perspective, just the versatility, what you can do from a scheme perspective because of the skill sets that you now have at your disposal. 
So I'm <laughs> the point that I'm getting at here, here at is don't forget about the scheme evolution that is likely to come based on the coaching additions and the personnel additions and, and, and how they've been very intentional about some of the swaps. I think it suggests scheme evolution. The next superlative is needs to rebound. And this is one of the easiest ones that I put down. The thing that needs to rebound for the Buffalo Bills in 2022 is the ability to win close games. This was a big talking point last year. The Bills were 0-5, 0-6, including the playoffs in one-score games. That wasn't a problem in 2020. The Bills were great in one-score games. They were 5-1. 5-1 in 2020. 20, fast forward one year, they're 0-5, 0-6, including the playoffs. And all, all of a sudden, we have to go crazy about, oh, the Bills can't win close games. They lost the clutch gene. I think we have to be willing to admit that there's a lot of randomness and variance in football. That makes people uncomfortable. And there's there's law of averages. You're not going to be 5-1 and one every year. That's crazy. And so the Bills respond with the regression to the mean, 5-1 and one to 0-6. But let's look at those games. Let's really quickly look at those six one-score losses. The Steelers, you had a blocked punt return for a touchdown. The Titans game, Josh Allen tripped on the fourth and one. The Jaguars game, you lost 6-9. to nine. I beg you to make one play against the Jaguars and win a damn game. The Patriots hurricane game, right? You had a missed field goal. You had multiple drop touchdowns. The Bucks game. How about that one? Just play 60 minutes. Show up in the first half. Don't have the coverage bust in overtime. And do I need to really say anything about the Chiefs in 13 seconds? Are you really going to ignore the context and just Sulk on the statistic, 0-6 in one-score game, Sean McDermott can't coach. Well, behind the stats, there's a story. I'm not panicking over this, but they do need to refine their ability to win close games. BetOnline.net is your number one source for all your betting needs and sports information. Find all the latest sports developments, league, review, re, league reviews, and news, including the Major League Baseball season, football's futures, Vegas casino games, they've got it all. Bet Online is your continued source for all your sports wagering information, including live betting, esports, and scores. And betonline.net remains the best spot for all your sports wagering information. That's the fastest and easiest way to check in on all your favorite sports and events, including MMA, boxing, and golf. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and the action. It's Bet Online, and it's where the game starts. We've got a couple more to get to here today. Last two will be Dark Horse, MVP, and Under the Radar. My Dark Horse MVP is is more interior pass rush and Von Miller as a closer. More interior pass rush and Von Miller as a closer. I just talked all about Ed Oliver, right? You, you 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 heard that. But how about Jordan Phillips? Last time he was in Buffalo, nine and a half sacks. How about Tim Settle? Some untapped potential and a lot of production in a limited amount of time with Washington. How about Boogie Basham, AJ Epinesa, and Greg Rousseau entering their next season as young players in them taking a step forward, and, and those guys being players that you, you feel like can reduce inside and threaten some interior gaps. Oh, by the way, Shaq Lawson. Oh, by the way, a closer in Von Miller. One of the things that I think we, we've forgotten about the, the Chiefs game, the, the divisional playoff loss, was how much pressure the Bills got on Pat Mahomes but just couldn't get him down. Couldn't get him down. Ed Oliver was winning consistently, didn't finish place. Other players as well. You have a closer in Von Miller. A guy that 
can dial it up on those long and late downs, that can dial it up in two minutes. He's going to help you win close games. But also, he's going to make your defense more disruptive. So, this D-line, to me, is worth buying into. It's worth getting exciting about, excited about. Now, some of that does re, you know, rely on some growth from some young players. But there's, there's more to be excited about with this D-line than I think ever under Sean McDermott in Buffalo. I think you're going to see some really effective pass rush from this group. Von Miller. They have a closer. They have interior rushers. They have more of it than ever before. So my dark horse MVP is more interior pass rush and Von Miller as a closer. And then my under the radar here to close it out is going to be what this team has been through in the path ahead. What this team has been through in the path ahead. You've probably heard me talk about teams in the NFL having to pay their dues. Well, I think this Bills team has certainly paid their dues over the last three seasons. The chaos of the Houston playoff loss. Not being good enough in 2020 in the AFC Championship game against the Chiefs to feel like you had such a good season, but realize that you had to take a step as a team to be able to get over Kansas City to last season and kind of, I don't know if stumbling through, but showing a lot of inconsistency during the regular season and kind of ramping it up and then having the game go the way that it did against Kansas City, the way you lost that game. This team is has paid its dues, they're battle-tested, and I think all of that can be used effectively and positively to impact your result this year. If you have good leadership, and I really do think the Bills do. And you have a really nice blend right now on this team of continuity. I mean, you're returning like 19 starters. but also some new, fresh voices and ideas with some of the coaching influx. And so I think this team is just really, really well positioned from a talent perspective, from a coaching perspective, from how I, th- it thinks, how I think things can evolve this year, from just the story of the last three seasons. I think it's all very beneficial to the Bills or, or to helping the Bills achieve their goals in 2022. And I like the path ahead. I do. What team right now are you sitting here fretting over that the Bills can't get past in the AFC? What team? Who is it? What team are you sitting here nervous about in the playoffs that the Bills can't beat? There's no team on that list for me. Now, you got to play games. You got to do it. There's a lot of variance. There's randomness, all that stuff. But the Bills have the makeup to win against any opponent in the NFL. And they're a battle-tested team that has paid their dues. And so while we can get excited about this season, we should, I want to remind ourselves why we're excited and what this team has been through, how it's been constructed, and the leadership in place. I think it's easy to say, wow, the Bills have Josh Allen and Stephon Diggs and uh, Von Miller and, and Trey White and really good safeties. and you, you get excited about this team. But it can't, it's got to be more than just names on a paper. And McDermott said that. It's got to be more than just the names on the paper. I think this team is entering this season with so much hunger, and motivation based on what's happened the last three seasons, how those seasons have finished. they got to go out and do it. But I just have a really hard time identifying that one thing or those couple of things that are going to be the X factors that prohibit it from happening outside of just the variance of football. So my under-the-radar take is what 
this team has been through and the path ahead. I would love to hear your picks for breakout guy, comeback kid, rising star. Don't forget about needs to rebound, dark horse MVP under the radar. Hit me up on Twitter at the Joe Marino. Join the Lockdown Bills Twitter community. Tomorrow, the Tremaine Edmonds pot. Can't wait for it. I'm going to break Tremaine Edmonds down somewhat like we did Levi Wallace last year, and I received a lot of great feedback on that podcast last year on Levi Wallace. And so I'm going to put him through a similar lens and talk about Tremaine Edmonds and just be really, really honest about what he is, was he, what he is in the path ahead, some of the underrated components of his game, some things that he has to get better at, the contract discussion. There's so many layers to Tremaine Edmonds. We're going to get into all of them tomorrow on the podcast. I do want to go ahead and let you know now, and I'll remind you tomorrow that I'm going to take off Monday for the 4th of July. I'm going to take that day off, but I'll be there for you Tuesday through Friday next week. So plan accordingly. Don't miss Tremaine Edmonds tomorrow. Make sure that you're subscribed. Would love it if you took a second to rate, review, and share the podcast. Have a great rest of your day, and I look forward to catching up with you again tomorrow.